Hello class, um, welcome to the lecture on the topic of virtual machines for security. This is a slightly long lecture in the sense that uh, I anticipate this to be longer than the one and a half hour slot. Uh, therefore, you can choose to break it up and watch it over multiple sessions if you so wish. So this particular topic on virtual machines for security will follow the theme of uh, uh, isolation. Right? Uh, that is, uh, it is going to try to understand, uh, it's going to develop techniques that tell you how to contain the effects of security. Um, we are also going to develop new security mechanisms that use virtualization technology uh, and provide new capabilities that are not possible without the use of virtualization. So uh, there are three readings for this particular portion of the course, um, two of which are directly related to security and one of which is uh, uh, background information on how virtualization works, uh, especially modern virtualization where hardware, hardware support for virtualization is now available. So you're going to be responsible for, of course, all the three. Um, I'm going to start off the lecture by providing technical background material on virtualization. Uh, and that will be the one that uh, one of the papers covers. Uh, next, we will be talking about how virtualization can be used to detect novel kinds of malicious software, including malicious software that affects the operating system itself. And third, uh, we will be talking about uh, this, uh, how to use virtualization uh, to build better intrusion detection systems. So let's get started. Uh, so let's first try to understand what is a, a system virtual machine. So there are different kinds of virtual machines. Of course, you know, we have language virtual machines, such as the ones that are used to run Java, for instance. But here we are going to be concerned with system virtualization, okay? So when I say system virtualization or a system virtual machine, I mean, it is the complete computing environment um, with the OS and so on, and uh, uh, also isolated processing capabilities and memory and communication channels. Okay, so we're going to set up a machine uh, which has its own notion of, of uh, a processor, it has its own notion of memory, and it has its own notion of IO channels, okay? And uh, that is what we're going to be constructing, right? You will see some of this material also in an operating systems course, and this material is also going to be related to the stuff that we'll cover later on in cloud computing. So the virtual machine uh, essentially should be an uh, efficient and isolated duplicate of the physical machine. Uh, in fact, the concept of virtualization, even though is very, very popular now, um, and uh, you know, form, forms the foundation of cloud computing, um, the concept of virtualization goes back to the 1970s. Uh, and the criteria of virtualization were formalized by these people called Popek and Goldberg. And in fact, the criteria for what constitutes a virtualizable architecture are called the Popek Goldberg criteria. Uh, so virtualization goes back to the 70s. In fact, it was invented by IBM. In fact, the concept, the notion of virtualization exists from even before, right? Virtual memory, for example, is a concept that uses virtualization to provide an illusion of having, you know, a different memory address space, uh, having more memory than the physical amount of memory that's there in the machine and so on. So that concept exists, right? But it was extended to full system virtualization in the, in the 1970s uh, by IBM where they wanted to virtualize their mainframe machines. And then the idea kind of died off. And the reason it died off was because mainframes, although they existed, personal computers became available and everybody had access to their own personal computing machines. So the concept and the need for virtualization was felt lesser and lesser, and so the ideas went away. This is until 1997 when virtualization actually came back with a paper called DISCO uh, from Stanford uh, and the 
faculty lead here was a person called Mendel Rosenblum. Uh, and he went on to uh, uh, take that technology and create VMware. So VMware came out of that one particular paper in 1997 uh, in SOSP. And so um, that is the history of, uh, of virtualization. Okay, so the basic idea behind virtualization is that, you know, there is uh, on top of the hardware, there is a layer called the virtual machine monitor or the virtual machine manager. This also goes by the name of hypervisor, and this is a software layer, right? So this is system software that directly virtualizes the hardware, and uh, uh, on top of this, you have these virtual machines. So it provides the illusion of, you know, its own computing environment, its own memory, communication channels, and so on. That's the job of the hypervisor. So here are the Popec Goldberg criteria for, you know, what constitutes a virtual machine monitor and what are the desirable qualities of a virtual machine monitor. So the first property is that of equivalence, okay? So the virtual machine monitor must provide a machine interface, a virtual machine interface that is similar to that of a physical or a real machine, right? It should be exactly the same. So if you've got an application or an operating system that's running inside the virtual machine, it should not be able to differentiate between uh, uh, the fact that it's running on a virtual machine or a physical machine. This is violated, uh, of course, in modern uh, takes on virtualization. For example, this concept called para-virtualization. But ideally, these are the criteria, right? You want equivalence. The second is that of safety or isolation, which is that every virtual machine should be isolated from the other, okay? And this property is going to be particularly key for... Um, for security, we will see that this notion of safety and isolation is going to be key for for uh, uh, for security. In fact, this is what enables the notion of cloud computing. Okay, again, we will see that you know modern attacks try to break this notion of isolation or safety uh, by using architectural side channels, and that's coming up later in the course. And the third concern is that of uh, performance overheads, right? And that should be low. The performance of a virtual machine should be as close as possible to a real machine. So that's the third criteria. Um, all right. Okay. So let us now look at the different kinds of virtualization. <coughs> so in order to do that, Let's begin with a picture of how a system looks like if you don't have uh, virtualization or rather virtual memory. So you have the bare hardware, which consists of the processor, storage, memory, uh, peripherals, and so on. And on top of that is the OS, right? The operating system is the one that runs at the processor's uh, kernel mode privileges, and uh, it contains the low level instructions that are that allows the operating system to directly interface with the hardware so the operating system is a very interesting piece of software right it has two interfaces one of course the interface that it exposes to the applications that's the system call interface and another interface that it uses to interact with the hardware right and sits in between and there are certain things that the operating system uh, uh, is the only one that is privileged to do Right. So, for example, if you have to go and access the peripherals or be able to create virtual memory mappings, all of those things are interested with the OS because physical access to devices is not given to applications directly. And this is done for the purpose of security and isolation, right? because the operating system also ensures that you isolate the, the memory views of one application from another application. The operating system manages this with the machinery of page tables. Likewise, you cannot give any one application uh, exclusive control over a peripheral because if the application turns out to be malicious and latches on to the, the peripheral, there should be some way, some agent that has the ability to, to shut down that application or take away the privileges over that peripheral from that application. So that layer of software is the OS, and that's why you, know, you see the picture organized the way it is. The operating system sits below the applications. Now, that's without virtualization. And if you do have virtualization, uh, this is what the picture looks like. Right? So on top of the hardware, you have a 
bare uh, on top of the bare hardware you have a piece of software called the virtual machine monitor or the hypervisor um and it's the job of the virtual machine monitor to expose virtual views of the physical hardware uh to individual virtual machines so if you look at the layer below and the layer above the virtual machine uh monitor layer below is the same as the traditional os that we saw before it's the actual physical hardware but the layer above it is to export these kinds of abstractions that are shown over here it should expose a virtual processor a virtual memory a notion of virtual memory virtual storage virtual peripherals and so on okay now given these peripherals these virtual peripherals you can actually create a full fledged machine on top of it because that's the interface that you get when you buy hardware it's the same interface that is exposed by the virtual machine monitor except that instead of physical uh resources you have virtual resources and so the virtual machine is built on top of it so the nice thing of course with virtualization is that you can run different kinds of operating systems it could be linux here windows here and so on okay so that's what you get with virtualization this might not be a picture that you are familiar with especially if you use uh you know the desktop virtualization open vm uh, uh, sorry a uh, uh, virtual box and so on and the reason is because i mean typically what you would see is that on top of the hardware you have an operating system that's called the host operating system and within which your virtual machine sort of runs like an application that's the view that most of you are familiar with that's the view that for example you know if you use virtual box or vmware uh, uh you know desktop edition that's what you would see and you know that that notion of virtualization is called hosted virtualization uh it's, it's uh, as opposed to this picture over here which is called bare metal virtualization and even though the pictures look slightly different um conceptually it's the same thing i mean even in hosted virtualization where you have a host operating system and so on there's a driver that sits within that host operating system that enables this uh, uh this view okay so if you were to and this is anecdotal evidence speaking with an engineer this was 10 years ago from from vmware uh going from hosted virtualization of this sort to uh sorry sorry hosted virtualization to uh bare metal virtualization of this sort uh the most of the code base remains the same it's only a few tens of thousands of lines that have to be changed to go from one to the other okay but if you go to the cloud for instance or if you go to the server edition of the of the virtual machines this is the picture that uh that you would see where the virtual machine monitor runs directly on top of hardware and virtual machines directly run on top of the virtual machine monitor okay so just like you have a system call interface from processes to the operating system uh in the case of virtual machine monitors you have called you have, you have what are called hyper call uh, interfaces between the virtual machine as well as the virtual machine monitor okay all right um so you can run different operating systems on the same hardware that's a big advantage uh, as i said you know linux and windows uh, and this was primarily the main motivation for the reinvention of virtualization back in 1997 right running different operating systems on top of the same multi processor hardware okay so you can have operating system diversity you can run both linux and windows on the same hardware um you have isolation and i will go back to the previous slide and explain this uh the hypervisor separates the virtual machines from each other and uh, it isolates the virtual machines from the hardware okay and of course the third advantage which is that uh, you know any time you want to you've got a client request that requires you to spin up a virtual machine it's as simple as just spawning a virtual machine you can on demand provision the hardware resources and the virtual machine manager multiplexes these virtual machines on top of the physical hardware okay so uh there is also some other advantages right i mean you can do things like high availability and load balancing so if your physical machine needs to go down for some sort of maintenance because of let's say hardware failures as a disk that failed a network peripheral that failed um you can transparently just migrate a virtual machine over to another physical machine fix the physical machine and then you are able to uh, obtain high availability that way as opposed to if a physical machine you know you have a disk crash or network interface failure 
the entire service that's running on that machine becomes unavailable. Any services you're running there. That's not true with virtual machines because now you can just migrate the virtual machine to a physical server that's, uh, that is uh, 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 you know, up and running and therefore still continue to provide the services of, that are running within the virtual machine. Okay, um, and the nice thing is also encapsulation, right? So the execution environment of an application is encapsulated within the virtual machine. So typically, you know, when you distribute software, you have to also tell the, uh, uh, you have to write a readme or you have to specify configurations saying how the application software must be set up. Um, if you have a virtual machine, you can do all of this setup and you don't have to write any of that. You just provide the virtual machine image and it just runs. And probably the example that sort of drives you closest to home uh, with respect to this course is the first homework, right? I didn't have to give you the code and then tell you how to configure the OS, disable ASLR, nothing, right? I had done all that for you in the virtual machine. Uh, I had put the vulnerable programs for you and sent it to you. All you had to do was to run it, right? So the execution environment of an application is encapsulated within this virtual machine, and that's a very big advantage now, right? You don't have to specify all kinds of assumptions or configurations. Okay, uh, one more question, and I think I will sort of mention this, and I will uh, maybe talk about it later, let's see. So when you typically think about um, hardware, right? Hardware has two modes of execution. We know this, the supervisor or the kernel mode of execution, and the user mode of execution. Uh, on Intel-like systems, um, actually there these this notion of, of uh, processor privilege is called processor protection rings. So Intel actually provides four protection rings, ring zero, ring one, ring two, and ring three. And it's generally the case that ring one and ring two are unused, uh, but that ring zero is supposed to be supervisor or kernel mode ring four, uh, ring three is supposed to be application mode, okay? So on the ARM, it's actually different. On the ARM architecture, they have what are called exception levels or ELs, and there are, again, four, but all four are used, okay? So the ARM architecture differs in that very important aspect from the Intel architecture uh, or the x86, right? So Intel or AMD, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so given that our processor has two execution modes, which is kernel as well as application. Um, what can we say with respect to which software executes where, right? So the operating system executes the processor's uh, supervisor mode and the applications execute the user mode. So that's good. You have two modes of execution and two layers of software. So everything is good. So now, and, and it's the kernel mode that you need in order to do privileged operations, for example, any access to hardware. So now in this picture, right, uh, that with virtualization, you actually have three layers. You have the virtual machine monitor, you have the guest operating system, and you have the application. But your hardware still only provides two layers, right? It only provides the supervisor mode of execution and the user mode of execution. So how are we going to map these three different layers that we have in our software stack? to uh, you know, what is available in the hardware. So the way this is done is that the virtual machine monitor is mapped to the kernel mode of the processor, and the guest OS and the application are mapped to the user mode, okay? So anytime an application wants to make a system call, for instance, it makes a call to this guest OS, and the guest OS, because it's running in user mode, cannot make the system call. As a result, what happens is that, you know, when this application makes a system call, it traps to the virtual machine monitor. Now, the virtual machine monitor, of course, has the privileges to go and satisfy the system call, perform whatever. So if it's a read or a write, you need to read from disk, okay? Or send a packet over the network. Now, the application, uh, the trap actually comes here and the virtual machine monitor can handle it, but it doesn't. The reason is because of the Popek and Goldberg criteria. If you look at the Popek and Goldberg criteria, uh, you need to have this notion of virtual machine being interface being similar to the real machine, which means that you know an operating system executing on top of virtual machine should not know that it's executing on top of virtual machine. The 
the, the operating system should be fooled into thinking that it's executing on real hardware. So when the trap comes, essentially what happens is that a virtual machine sends it back to this guest OS, which seems as though the trap has come from hardware. And it starts, it sort of prompts the OS to execute. The OS sort of executes the system call as it were uh, with uh, their uh, you know, physical execution on top of a non-virtualized system. And then it traps once again to return control back to the application. At which point in time, because the guest OS is in user mode, it cannot really transfer control back to the application. That involves writing to the CR, CR3 register or the page table based register. You can't do that in user mode. So control goes back to the virtual machine monitor, which then changes the that register, CR3, page table based register, uh, on behalf of this guest OS. And so that's how system calls are processed on a virtual machine. Okay, so you have this multiple transitions between the application and the virtual machine and the operating system and the virtual machine. Uh, so that that's kind of important in the way that uh, that uh, uh, virtualized machines behave. So this virtual machine monitor, in some sense, behaves as a reference monitor that's able to completely mediate any sensitive operations coming from any virtual machine. OK, um, so there are other kinds of virtual machines, as I was mentioning right at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, there are language virtual machines, things like Java and so on, which are mostly focused on running individual applications. Um, and the main goal of providing a virtual machine over here is portability so that you can just, you know, anybody who has this virtual machine is able to execute a Java program because all the you compile it down to Java bytecode. Java bytecode is the, uh, in some sense, the machine language of your, uh, that's exported by your Java virtual machine. Okay. There are also other kinds of lightweight virtual machines. Uh, again, I will put this within quotes that are beginning to get a, gain a lot of popularity. We will talk about this later. These are called containers. Um, so Docker, for example, is one. Uh, native client from Google. This is no longer a very active project, but aspects of it are now within Chrome. Uh, so FreeBSD is jail utility. These are all examples of uh, lightweight virtualization. It's too much to call them a virtual machine in the sense that we are studying in this particular lecture, but uh, they are also isolation mechanisms. And we will talk about them when we study cloud computing, in particular Docker and the features that uh, Linux provides. So our goal here is whole system virtualization, and we want to somehow create this copy of the whole machine. Okay, so I already mentioned this, but now let us uh, talk about it in more detail. There are two kinds of virtualization, which is bare metal as well as hosted. Bare metal is the one that's typically run on servers, uh, and these are server editions, right? VMware ESX server, Zen, and so on. These are all pieces of software that run directly on the bare metal uh, uh, virtual machine monitor directly control the physical machine. The other form which you are more familiar with uh, as end users are hosted virtualization technology, where the virtual machine monitor in some sense gives you the illusion of running as a guest application on top of a host operating system. Okay, Examples of this are KVM. Right? KVM is just a bunch of modifications to standard Linux that converts it into, uh, you know, it, that provides it with the ability to, to run uh, virtual machine images. VMware Workstation, which is the desktop edition of VMware. These are all examples of hosted virtualization. Okay, so let us understand how we should implement a virtual machine monitor. None of this has anything to do directly with security, but it's important to understand these concepts. And that's why I'm presenting the details of virtualization for you. So there are three important pieces when you try to break down a system. Um, these are instructions or you know the processing abstraction that's defined by the instruction set architecture. There's memory and there is IO, right? So these are the pieces of any physical hardware. You can categorize it into these three categories. And when we want to create a virtual machine, the main goal is to try to emulate these three things, right? Or virtualize these three things. So mostly it's going to be only a first a discussion of instructions and memory in this uh, lecture. Uh, the third one, IO, is also very interesting, how you virtualize IO. Uh, 
but we will be discussing that in much more detail in the operating systems course next semester right i'm not really going to talk about io that much although there are interesting security papers and security projects that lie on virtual io not going to talk about it so much in for the purposes of this class okay so we'll start with instructions so we will see how instructions can be virtualized and so on so there are many ways by which instructions can be uh, virtualized right so the question for you is you know when you think about the execution of instructions on a typical processor which are the instructions that require the intervention of the os and when do instructions execute natively on top of the hardware so you will see that most instructions execute natively on top of the hardware including instructions that are accessing memory say loads and stores and so on they directly go to the hardware where they are serviced by the memory manager right uh, which has access to the page tables the only time the operating system comes into the picture is if a mapping for a particular virtual machine a uh, virtual address does not exist in which case the operating system is invoked there is a fault and the it, it allocates a page and the corresponding virtual to physical mapping is entered into the page table by the operating system now that page table is a very interesting data structure right it's a hardware structure uh, that is managed completely by the hardware and is accessible by the hardware but that's also mapped into the operating system right so the operating system can also manage it so it's a very interesting sort of engineering challenge as to how these uh, page tables were designed and how they are the hardware and the software work in uh, in cooperation to enable this notion of virtual memory so given that most instructions just run directly on top of the hardware uh, one way to do virtualization is direct execution which is you know you just run most of the instructions of the virtual machine directly on top of the hardware and so you get performance that is very close to native execution okay only problem is of course you can you cannot how do you ensure isolation of protection because one of the things that you want with a virtual machine is that you know you don't want instructions executing in one virtual machine for example accessing storage uh, to directly go and uh, impact another virtual machine because at the end of the day isolation is one of the original popec goldberg criteria of virtualization okay so if you want to ensure isolation or protection we need some additional mechanisms and that's what i'm going to talk about both software as well as hardware mechanisms have been developed software mechanisms were how uh, virtual machines were implemented in the late 90s to the early 2000s uh, they used emulation trap and emulate as i will talk about um, but the performance of these techniques is rather slow which then forced hardware companies to start thinking about virtualization support in their instruction set architectures right so that is what intel vtx is uh, for instance right it's virtualization extensions uh, to allow efficient support of virtualization on top of the x86 architecture okay so what you need so uh, i'm going to talk about the first idea which is trap and emulate which is a software only technique to implement isolation with these few instructions that cannot directly be uh, executed by hardware so here is one instruction right i mean one instruction is the instruction that goes and modifies the page table base register and therefore you know does a context switch so these are things that you can only execute with kernel mode of privileges and you cannot just let the the instruction be executed from user mode so we need to be able to ensure that virtualization is enabling this so how do we do this well you know the idea is that whenever the virtual machine see whenever you try to execute user mode tries to let's say write to the cr3 register the hardware is not going to allow it it's not going to allow it because that instruction can only be executed in kernel mode the processor knows this right so the processor raises an exception and it traps to the hypervisor uh, and at this point when the virtual machine tries to execute this it's trapped to the hypervisor and what the hypervisor can do at this point is to emulate these instructions completely within the hypervisor okay so you change the state of the virtual hardware for example you change the state of the virtual cr3 and then you return control okay uh, so these are only for sensitive instructions all other instructions will uh, execute as normal okay so there are 
more details on trap and emulate, you know, you might want to think about your instructions as falling into two categories, which are uh, user instructions, you know, things like arithmetic instructions, load, store, and so on. These are compute instructions. And there are system instructions. These are instructions that can change the privileged state of the system and therefore typically cannot execute the user mode of execution. And these are returned from system call, you know, in B, out B, and so on, that directly write into peripheral buffers. Um, and you want to make sure that you emulate the system instructions while allowing the user instructions to directly execute on top of hardware. So there are two modes of CPU ex operation, as you already know, I told you just a few minutes ago, right? The user mode of execution and the privileged mode of execution. So the user mode of execution is ring three and the privilege mode is ring zero. And if you attempt to execute user mode instructions in, uh, 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 sorry, privileged instructions in user mode um, or instructions such as IRAT, uh, INV LPG and so on in user mode, it hardware raises a what is called a general protection fault. And the general protection fault is generally handled within the software. On a non-virtualized system, the general protection fault is handled by the operating system, which is the stuff that runs in kernel mode of that system. But on a virtualized system, it goes to the virtual machine monitor or the hypervisor. Okay, so the system state, for example, you know, you uh, uh, you know, you control registers like CR3. Uh, what you do is you run the virtual machine user mode, and the hypervisor in ring zero. Any time the system execute the virtual machine tries to execute one of these system instructions, tries to access system state, you trap to the virtual machine monitor and have the virtual machine monitor, which is running in kernel mode of execution at that point, do these operations on your behalf. Okay. Okay, so all of this was formalized by Popek and Goldberg in their classic 1974 paper on virtualization. Okay, so what they say is that if you have a control sensitive instruction, which is an instruction that can update system state, that must be emulated by the virtual machine manager and uh, behavior sensitive instructions, which is there are certain sensitive data structures in the, in the hardware and uh, if the instructions behavior depends upon that system state. Um, both of these have to be virtualized, okay? So the main requirement is that, you know, if an architecture must support this, if you must be able, to, so when is an architecture virtualizable? It's virtualizable if these two kinds of instructions result in a general protection fault, okay? Only if you have a general protection fault can you even do trap and emulate. So it so turns out that one of the early challenges for implementing virtualization completely in software using things like trap and emulate, this is the general formula for all virtual machines, by the way, trap and emulate, was that the Intel x86 architecture, not all instructions were virtualizable. Okay, and the ASPLOS 2006 paper that is assigned reading for uh, this this course, I think it's VMI1, that paper, or VMI2, it talks about the tricks that they used to uh, even do trap and emulate in those cases for instructions that didn't really raise a general protection fault when they were executed. Uh, and so that situation has been fixed, but it sort of goes to show you the challenges in building a virtual machine monitor for the very first time. Okay, so that's instructions. For instructions, it's basically trap and emulate. <clears throat> and for memory, right? I mean, uh, think about memory in an unvirtualized system. So you have physical memory. This is the memory card that's installed on your machine. But you know that every process has its own virtual, machine, virtual memory image. And that's what this is, right? The stuff shown in light green over here, every process has a virtual address space. And the pages in the virtual address space are mapped to the physical pages. Uh, and that mapping is done by the page table. So these red arrows that you see in between are nothing but the page table that's managed by the operating system. It's a hardware structure. Now, you know, if you have virtualization, right? Okay, that's the page table. Uh, and you consult the page table in order to go and do the green to orange mappings. 
Okay, so if you want to do memory virtualization, you should not be able to access physical memory directly from the virtual machine. Only the hypervisor should manage physical memory. But at the end of the day, right, I mean, even if you were to do exactly all of this, this is what an operating system does. On top of your hypervisor is running a virtual machine with a full-fledged guest operating system that thinks that it has all of access to physical memory. So what you want to do is you want to provide the illusion uh, that the guest OS is actually accessing all of physical memory. You want to be able to fool the guest OS into thinking that. The guest OS, you know, it's, it's an unmodified guest operating system, right? So if you take an operating system image and then you, you install it, the code actually contains things like page tables and so on. So that operating system poor guy thinks it's running on top of physical memory, whereas in fact it's running on top of some virtualized notion of memory that's exported to it by the hypervisor. So how do we reconcile all this? Well, it sort of turns out that this notion of virtual memory itself has got to be virtualized. Take it up one more level. So if you if we work our way up from the bottom of the of the uh, of the hierarchy, which is you closest to the hardware, you have the real memory, which is the physical memory that's uh, installed on your machine, and the hypervisor actually provides an illusion to every virtual machine that it has its own physical memory. And the way it does it is by actually doing something very similar to the operating system. It virtualizes the physical memory. Okay, and so that's what these uh, orange boxes shown at on the second level are. But now, of course, the operating system it has its own notion of of page tables, and it thinks that what has been given to it is the physical memory. So it's going to create its own page table. So applications are now if you start a process, that's going to get its own address space. But that address space is mapped to this page table. Now that is actually virtual memory, and that's mapped to the physical memory. So what you have are two levels, right? So you have this layer that's the guest physical memory. So these are called guests, and this is the host. So this is guest physical memory, and this is the host memory, physical memory. The guest physical memory is actually nothing but a virtualized version of the host physical memory, okay? And on top of that, of course, you have the guest virtual memory, which is the memory of these applications. So there are two page tables here. One is, of course, the guest page table that's managed by individual operating systems here. And there is a lower level page table over here, which is these notions of memory that are mapped to real physical memory. And that is called a nested page table or an extended page table. Now, if you look at Zen, there is another structure called shadow page tables. That's a different thing. Nested page tables are the standard structure nowadays exported by uh, by things like the Intel x86 architecture. So this nested page table stores mappings from here to here, and guest page tables store mappings from here to here. Okay, so the guest page table, every time an application tries to access a piece of memory, the application is going to access virtual memory. That virtual memory is going to get translated to some location over here in the guest physical memory, which is then going to be translated by a second level of page table, the nested page table, to the actual real physical memory from where things are served back to the application. Okay. So the guest virtual address is uh, uh, first translated using the guest page table to the guest physical address. And uh, the guest physical address is then translated to the system or the host physical address using the nested page table. And if you take a course in architecture or you take a course in operating systems, You'll see that you know you might recall that there are multiple levels of page tables in any real modern system. So you'll see that the number of memory accesses, the worst case to go from guest virtual addresses to the system physical address is actually uh, it's it's quadratic. It's in fact this times this, the number of levels here times the number of levels here, right? So uh, so it can get really really expensive on uh, on modern hardware if you have if you're unable to resolve the addresses. Okay, so let's look at some applications of uh, of uh, virtualization, right? Uh, and uh, we will the again there are two readings here, right? Uh, so the general concept I'm going to be presenting to you is this notion of what is called virtual machine introspection, 
which is the hypervisor is able to examine the state of a virtual machine, which is either interposed on instruction execution or be able to inspect the contents of its memory and then understand or reason about what is going on within the virtual machine. Okay, that method of implementing security solutions is called virtual machine introspection. Okay, uh, and the two readings, the first one is called, uh, in fact, that paper was the one that introduced by Garfinkel and, and Rosenblum. That's the paper that introduced the term called virtual machine introspection. And they talk about how you can build better intrusion detection systems and so on. Uh, now, I'm not going to discuss that paper in too much detail in the slides because it's actually a very straightforward read. Uh, it's a very well written paper, but it's very straightforward as well. There is nothing, no challenges there in terms of uh, understanding the material over there. So I will just briefly mention the concepts from that paper as I move along, but you have to read the paper. Rather, what I'm going to focus on in the class, in, these, uh, in the lecture is uh, how virtual machines and virtual machine introspection uh, allow you to detect uh, you know, a novel class of malware called rootkits. So as you all know, you know, there are worms, viruses, Trojan horses, spyware, and more recently, you know, things like ransomware and so on. All of these are malicious software that execute in user mode. But it so turns out that in fact, the operating system itself can get infected, right? How can the operating system get infected? I will tell you as I progress through the lecture. But if the operating system gets infected, the problem is that, you know, because on most systems, the operating system is the, uh, is the trusted computing base, right? It's running with kernel mode privileges, it's generally trusted. You cannot use the operating system to detect infections against itself. The only way you can do it is from a layer below the operating system, which on a non-virtualized system is hardware and a virtualized system is the hypervisor, okay? So, the only reliable way to detect rootkits that we know so far is either with hardware support or with virtualization support. Okay. So as we know, modern computer systems are uh, built in layers, right? So at the lowest layer, there's hardware, and then there is the operating system, which runs with kernel privileges, then we have utilities and libraries and user applications on top. Right? So they are built using layers of abstraction. Each layer abstracts upon the facilities provided uh, in the lower layer and presents higher level abstractions to the layers above. Now, what is the relevance of this to computer security? So it turns out that there is a fundamental connection, which is that in security, uh, the lower you go in this layered stack, the more control you have. So this holds true both from the perspective of an attacker as well as that of a defender. So I will make this perspective clear uh, in the next few slides using an example. Okay. So let us take the classic example of malware detection. Okay, you downloaded an application from somewhere and you suspect that it's malware or, you know, when you downloaded your system's um, default policy is to scan the application for traces of malicious behavior, right? It could be an application, it could be a network packet, whatever it is, it is suspect. So how do you do it? Well, generally speaking, there is a malware detector, an antivirus or a scanning tool or a firewall or something like that, that is sitting usually as a user application uh, could be implemented within the kernel but you know when most commodity off the shelf malware detectors you buy are um, user space applications so how does this malware detector scan the user application well you know one way to do it is to sort of do use the user utilities right uh, cat ps ls list the contents and then sort of scan the contents so if you were to follow this approach or this malware detector to, were to follow this approach, it is in some sense trusting the CAT, the PS, and the LS, these are all utilities to provide the correct result. So in some sense, the trusted computing base or the TCB is the utilities and the libraries and everything below it. Because 
all of these applications also rely on the correct operation of the operating system. So that's the trusted layer. But if your TCB is so large and you include all of these layers in the TCB, it's actually pretty easy to uh, bypass such a malware detector. Okay. So for example, you know, let's say that a malicious actor were to be able to get control over the system and replace the utilities and the libraries. So that's what's shown in this pink box over here. What it could do is that when the malware detector, let's say, sends a request to show me the file contents and it uses the cat utility, the cat utility can work in tandem with this malicious application to make sure that any fake or bina, you know, any bin, any uh, uh, malicious content over here is hidden from the malware detector. So it only presents some fake or benign content to the malware detector, which then uses that that content to make a determination of whether something is malware or not. And in this particular case, it will say everything is fine. Okay, so this is a problem uh, if your TCB is so large. So then of course, you know, we can make a better malware detector. And the way we can make a better malware detector is for the malware detector to actually make a system call to uh, ask the OS to go and provide the contents of this other user application. The operating system has a module that then goes and reads the file on behalf of this malware detector and that provides the true file content. Okay, So this approach would work and would return the true file content even if all the utilities and libraries are untrusted. Okay or are under the control of the attacker. Now, the nice way of the, 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 now the advantage of doing something like this is that, you know, with this approach, you can also detect any malicious user level utilities. Because all you can do is you can run a cat of this file and you can do a read of this file and then compare the results and they better be the same. Because one is from a trusted API and one is from an untrusted API. And so you can determine if this cat is actually returning to your correct context. This is called differential analysis. Okay, but you can see the advantages over here of lowering your TCB. Your TCB now just consists of the operating system and the hardware and the user space utility. Not only can you detect malicious user applications, you can also detect the attacker's attempt to tamper with the utilities and the libraries. Okay, so you will also notice that in the picture before, over here, you were able to detect bad actions here from the layer below. But if that layer below itself is compromised, you can't really do much. You have to rely on the layer even below it, right? So if the utilities and libraries are compromised, you have to rely on the operating system to scan all layers above it. You can detect malicious user applications and you can also detect malicious utilities and libraries, okay? So this is what we mean by the lower you go, the more power you have, or the layer below principle in computer security. Okay, so the question then happens, you know, that you can ask me is, what happens if the operating system itself gets compromised? And I will tell you how this is possible, okay? But let's just say hypothetically, if your operating system is compromised, then what happens? Right? I mean, just like you could not detect malicious utilities from the utility layer itself, you cannot scan the utilities using bad utilities. If your operating system is corrupted, basically the operating system cannot be relied upon to ensure correct operation of anything above it. Okay? And even if you want to scan and detect whether the operating system is corrupted, you can't do it with a corrupted operating system itself. You need the support of something that is trusted in the layer below. Okay, so a rootkit is the name given to a malware that it infects the operating system. And so the advantage of rootkits is that, uh, why, why bad guys like it so much, is because rootkits allow you to hide malware from malware detectors. So most commodity off the shelf malware detectors that you can buy in the marketplace, they, they, they assume that the operating system is part of the TCB and they rely on the system call API. But if the system call API itself is, is compromised and the operating system itself can lie to the malware detector. Okay, so an operating system can get infected in any number of ways. So we want to somehow figure out ways and means by which 
the operating system runs bad code or you know has malicious code inserted inside um, so there are a number of ways in which this can happen so the kernel itself is a piece of low level code that's written in uh, c c++ so there's no reason why you cannot exploit your kernel in just the same way that you exploit any other user program the only inter the, the only detail that you'll have to uh, keep in mind is the interface the attack surface if you will and that is the system call api so through the system call api you can actually get uh, inject uh, malicious uh, uh, data especially if you notice that there are any buffer overflows any similar memory errors and take over the privileges of the kernel okay so that's one uh, the other of course is what is called a privilege escalation attack where what you would do is you would exploit a root process or a set uid root process and get root privileges now a root process still runs in user mode but because of the way that uh, operating system permissions are set up on your system the root has the permissions to go and overwrite the operating system files or update the operating system and so on root users are generally given this privilege so if you have root access you can then go and download uh, a malicious kernel and then the next time the system boots it's going to boot the malicious kernel okay so we'll see later in the course how you can actually detect malicious kernels or kernels that have been tampered with using a process called hardware based attestation again you'll see that hardware comes to the rescue layer below okay not the operating system itself it's the layer below so that's coming later in the course when we talk about cloud computing and so on. And the third, of course, is social engineering attacks, right, where you trick a user into installing fake kernel updates. Right? Generally speaking, this attack surface has been closed right now, but it used to be there. So uh, prior to the Windows Vista operating system, which is 2007-ish or so, 2008, I think, anybody could go and write to the kernel.dll file in windows uh, any user right and you could therefore overwrite the kernel likewise if you had any peripheral that you installed right i mean typically you have to install the supporting driver and uh, these drivers uh, you know anybody could just have a send you a driver and you could install it now it's not possible okay now they do something called signature verification. Uh, I will, this will become clear when we talk about uh, uh, signature verification in a couple of lectures. But the idea is that you digitally sign the driver and then you check the, uh, that you're downloading the correct version. Let's say that's approved by Microsoft. Okay, so this is how operating systems get infected. So it's a real threat. And in fact, there was a study that was done in around 2010 by Microsoft. Uh, that went on to conclude that nearly 7% of all infections uh, in a malicious uh, machines that were observed worldwide were infections that were caused because of rootkits. Okay. Uh, now, this can get especially dangerous if uh, you, know, you start thinking about all kinds of other devices that also run operating systems, which is basically everything nowadays, IoT devices. But the Android system for instance you know there was a high profile rootkit that was developed for it in 2016 called humming bug or humming bad and there were rumors that it infected about 85 million android devices okay so it was used primarily for sending advertisements uh, anybody who clicks the ad you know the advertising revenue goes to the malware author and apparently they were earning three hundred thousand dollars each week through these fraudulent mobile advertisements but just imagine, you know, your phone is in many ways your lifeline, right? These days, it's your second form of authentication, second factor authentication, your OTPs come there and so on. So, you know, your, if your phone gets infected, it's, it's a pretty devastating situation. In fact, if your phone is infected, the attacker can track your location, right? Because they all they have to do is they have to just keep monitoring the GPS. You can turn off the GPS or location, but if the OS is infected, it can turn it back on, not notify you. 
So they can record your voice calls, they can, you know, record your video, turn on the camera, uh, track your location. It is actually scary. And the worst part is you will not know that you are a victim because it's the OS that's doing all of this. And generally, you trust the OS, right? And if the OS is doing it, the OS can do it in a very stealthy way. So it's also been, you know, rootkits have also been used in many high profile incidents. Uh, so if you Google these names, you'll see them. There were botnets back in the uh, late 2000s. Uh, there was a very famous case in Greece where uh, wiretapping was conducted by installing rootkits in the, in the wiretapping victims machines. Uh, Sony got into a lot of uh, soup because uh, they installed rootkits on end user devices. So it's a big problem. Rootkits are a big problem. Okay. So the question is, how do we detect rootkits, right? Now your operating system is compromised. And as I told you, you know, if you want to detect something bad at a particular layer, you have to go to the layer below. So what executes below the operating system? Well, if you're working on a virtualized system, it's the hypervisor, right? And what we are going to see in today's lecture is, you know, how can you detect malicious operating systems using the hypervisor? So your hypervisor is the TCB or the virtual machine monitor is the TCB. Now, if you're thinking the way that you should be thinking in this course, you will ask me what happens if the hyper hypervisor gets infected, okay? And in fact, there are cases that uh, have been shown where the hypervisor itself is infected. So you can Google this thing called blue pill. Uh, there was also a paper called Subvert published in 2006 uh, that essentially talk about how you can just slip a hypervisor, uh, a compromised hypervisor underneath an operating system and uh, use it to let's say log keystrokes and so on of everything that is sitting above right so it's extremely dangerous now of course you know to detect bad uh, hypervisors you have to go to the layer below which is hardware or firmware and the question is you know is that reliable so it so turns out that you know even hardware you can have uh, you can have uh, exploits embedded in them so Stuxnet, which is this really famous incidence of uh, the Iranian nuclear reactors being hijacked by, uh, uh, you know, actually uh, compromised firmware is the most important example that comes to mind. But also, you know, um, it so turns out that hardware is actually manufactured as software. So all the big hardware manufacturing companies, they have chip level designs in higher level languages like VHDL, Verilog, and so on. And these pass through a compiler tool chain, just like your C tool chain. They have a, a tool chain that compiles it to a format called a netlist, which is then given to a fabricator to go and burn it on silicon. So you can see there are so many entities in that supply chain, starting from, of course, the hardware manufacturer who can embed malicious circuits and so on. Uh, all the way down to the compiler that builds the netlist and then the netlist is now um, going to be fabricated. All of these things, there are this, you have to trust the whole supply chain. And you can actually embed malicious functionality within the hardware itself. Now, this is not a joke, right? I mean, in the sense that it is possible and it's not possible just for the sake of it. Uh, in cases like, uh, in areas like defense sector, where, you know, they deploy IoT devices on the field to protect our soldiers and so on, if there are any Trojan uh, integrated circuits or Trojan, uh, uh, you know, chips that are part of this uh, critical infrastructure, uh, you can bring the whole system down. Same thing, you know, you can see the Iranian nuclear reactor, right? I mean, that was a critical infrastructure that was brought down. Same thing for electrical grid and you know, our telephone infrastructure. So all of these things, right, we are relying on the hardware. And you can, in some sense, think about where this hardware is manufactured, right? Uh, most of the things these days, of course, are made in China and, you know, the supply chain is from elsewhere. So you're trusting a lot of people. And this is putting a lot of people in panic nowadays because all of this hardware that we are using and trusting is manufactured by 
uh, entities that are not really friendly to our country. Right? So we have to pay attention to this fact. Okay, so how do we detect rootkits? Well, so I'm going to talk about one particular methodology of uh, detecting rootkits, and this is the subject of the third paper uh, that uh, is assigned for virtual machine introspection. And hopefully I can use this, uh, this portion here to tell you about this problem of semantic gaps. Okay, so how do you go and uh, uh, analyze a trust, uh, you know, a machine that you think is potentially rootkit infected? Well, you have a machine, right? And it's running on top of hardware. So either you can have a separate analysis machine that's able to get the memory snapshots from here reliably, or you have a hypervisor that's sitting underneath this operating system that's able to read the memory of the virtual machine in it. Remember, there were two layers uh, in the memory abstraction, right? There was the guest virtual, uh, guest physical, and the host physical or the system physical memory. Now, because the hypervisor sits uh, below the, uh, you know, the guest physical memory, it can actually go and see a complete snapshot of what is running inside the, the target machine. Okay, so that's how you go and fetch memory snapshots. I'll tell you how you can use these memory snapshots to detect infection in a machine. Okay, so what we want is, we want to, let's say, somehow pause this machine, get a complete snapshot of the machine as it exists at, let's say, a given point in time. You get all the memory pages, and now you're able to analyze the pages. So there's the mechanism and there's the policy. The mechanism is fetching the pages that is possible using hypervisors. You pause the virtual machine and you can analyze its snapshot. And uh, there is the policy, you know, which is how do you go about figuring out whether the system is rootkit infected or not? And that's what I'm going to tell you. Okay, so which algorithm should you use for the analysis of memory snapshots? Uh, that's a matter of policy, right? And I'm going to show you that the way to detect rootkits is by thinking about it as a problem of invariant violations. So there are certain invariants that any correct operating system should uh, satisfy. And uh, any violation of these invariants means that the system is potentially infected. Okay, so the mechanism, as I said, is that of fetching memory pages of the uh, machine that you think is potentially rootkit infected, but without involving the target operating system. Okay, that's the mechanism. And that's the feature that virtual machine monitors or hypervisors actually provide for you. This feature of being able to fetch the memory pages. So let's look at some rootkits in operation and then see how to detect it. So the first one is an example from Linux. This is called the Adore rootkit. The real rootkit. Let's see how it works. So let's say you have a user application. It's trying to, let's say, open some file. So it issues a system call. The way it works is that, you know, you go down here into the OS. The OS has a function pointer table called the system call table, which contains the address of where the sysopen command, the actual low level instructions that open a file are implemented. Okay. So this is a function pointer. The function pointer is pointing to the sysopen. Now, what a bad guy can do is that, remember, the goal of rootkits is stealth, right? So they will do something bad, but then also do the actual operation that you asked or requested. So the bad guy can replace the sysopen function pointer with an evil open, just one data structure, one data modification within the operating system a uh, vast operating system state data structure. And the evil open will actually point to a function of the attackers choosing that is now downloaded into the kernel that does something malicious and then invokes this sysopen function. So as far as the application is concerned, the file will open, get a file descriptor and so on. Sysopen happens, but also something malicious has happened. So that's how the Linux Adore rootkit worked. Okay. And so over here, there was a fundamental uh, invariant that was violated, which is that once your operating system has been initialized, 
there is no reason for the system called table to change unless you are updating the operating system. The updating the operating system is actually a major operation, right? You don't let random user applications do it. So the uh, system call table was modified in this case uh, when it should not have been. So that's the invariant that's violated. So here's the second example of a rootkit. This is a Windows Foo rootkit. I'm going to present how this works uh, at a very high level. In fact, the paper that you're reading uh, has a very detailed low-level description of how a similar rootkit works on Linux also. But the idea here is that both Windows and Linux, they manage processes using a data structure. In this case, it's a doubly linked list. Uh, the paper actually talks about a tree structure. But the idea is that there are uh, it manages all running processes using, uh, so every running process on a Linux system is managed using a structure called a task struct. There's a similar structure in Windows also. Okay, so this picture shows you that the task structs are organized in two linked lists, right? So there is this orange linked list and there is the blue linked list. So it turns out that, you know, uh, the, the two linked lists are used for two different uh, reasons. Uh, the first linked list, which we will call run list, is not the actual name, I'm just giving it a name, the orange linked list. It is used by the scheduler to select processes for execution, right? The scheduler actually traverses these orange links and then chooses processes based upon whatever scheduling policy, right? I'm not saying you'll go round robin, but there is some policy, but if you want to find a process for scheduling, the scheduler uses it using these orange links. These blue links on the other hand are used for process accounting, okay? So things like PS and so on, if you want to see your Windows task manager, if you were to see what processes are running on the system. Such utilities end up using, uh, the call, invoke the system call that cause the operating system to go and traverse this blue link list. So now let me ask you a question, right? I mean, supposing you want to run a malicious process on your system, but uh, you don't want to account for it in the sense that, you know, if you were to view it in the task manager, it should not be visible. So you can therefore hide the process for a longer time. The only visible footprint of it would be, you know, extra, extra processor cycles that the process consumes. So how do you do this? So simple, right? You create your process and if you can modify your operating system, uh, basically two pointers so that it's not part of the, uh, it's so that it's not part of the all tasks linked list, but it is part of the run list linked list. So you as the bad guy will just modify the run list forward and backward pointers and put the hidden process as part of the run list. So now what happens? Well, this process gets scheduled for execution, but you do PS or you see the Windows task manager. There is no account of the process at all, right? So you've hidden a process. You can use this to log keystrokes, you know, send packets out over the network, whatever a process can do. So what invariant was violated here? Well, one invariant that we would like to see holding is that every task that is part of the run list is also accounted for. That is, it is part of all tasks. Okay, so that is violated here because now you have created something that's in run list that's not in all tasks. Okay, so how do you detect these invariants? I mean, this is a, operating systems are vast, right? I mean. Uh, you have thousands of these data structures. How do you expect to write down invariants? So your paper talks about invariants as being provided by, uh, you know, a system administrator. But I will tell you that it need not be completely manual. You can actually automate the task of creating these invariants. The way you do it is by taking a clean reference machine that's not rootkit infected, that you know it's a controlled machine. You run various user benchmarks and then you observe these snapshots of memory pages and then use that as your positive examples. Right? If you're into machine learning, right, these are the positive examples and you want to try to learn the common features in these positive examples. And you enforce these positive examples as the good behavior. So anything that violates the good behavior that you have seen is then um, uh, automatically considered to be bad. 
So this way of doing security, where you found these things that are good and you're trying to see what is bad, is called anomaly detection. It's a very important subfield of security, anomaly detection. OK, so these uh, memory pages in this process of anomaly detection, of course, the first phase of anomaly detection is an offline phase where you've got these snapshots from a clean reference machine and it's called a training phase. This is completely standard machine learning terminology. Although the papers that we are reading are from the early uh, uh, 2010s, earlier part of this decade. Um, and uh, you know most of the techniques used to uh, obtain these invariants are uh, uh, fairly simple. Since 2012 and so on, machine learning technology has really picked up. So it would be a perfectly fine, for example, research project to see how modern machine learning can help with this problem. But in some sense, the, the training phase uh, would perform some sort of inference on these uh, raw memory pages, build a feature set, and uh, that feature set becomes stored in an in a invariant database. And um, what happens is that when you're running right, uh, a machine, you would do exactly the same thing. You would fetch a snapshot of these memory pages and you would uh, uh, compare the uh, properties that you observe in the memory pages against this invariant database. And that tells you whether something has been compromised. So I'll give you one example right, uh, of what happens when you analyze these memory pages. Well, so you have kernel data structure definitions, right? It's task struct and so on. And what you, and, and entry points into the kernel. So entry point, these are all available, for example, on Linux, it used to be called a file called system.map. It gives you actual raw addresses where you can find various data structures. For example, init task is a first task. It is of type task struct. And when you get a memory page, this tells you exactly where init task is. OK, and what happens here is that uh, uh, in this particular case, right, when you fetch or your hypervisor only sees these raw memory pages, that's the only view that it has. Now, when you are given raw memory pages, you need to be able to analyze it or have some hook to be able to go and understand what's in those memory pages. And that hook, that additional information is being provided by a mixture of these two things. You have got an entry point into the kernel saying that at this address, if you go and see the memory contents, what is there is this thing called init task. And uh, you know the init task that is there is uh, of this particular data type called task struct. Okay, So task struct is a particular uh, data structure definition. If you go to the C programming language, you will see that uh, task struct has a particular structure definition. If you go within the Linux kernel, I mean, you will see a, it has a particular definition. And so that definition, that structure definition, it allows you to interpret the memory. So if the task struct, for example, the size of the structure is 16 bytes, you'll just go and read the next 16 bytes that are starting over here. And you know maybe the first field over here is a four byte integer, then you will read the first four bytes and that's an integer and you can make sense of it. So these raw memory pages are what the hypervisor sees, but in order for the hypervisor's uh, uh, output, which is these memory pages, to be analyzable or to make sense of it, you need this additional information. Okay, any analysis tool that builds on top of the hypervisor's output, which is these memory pages, will need um, uh, all of uh, 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 this additional information. So that is the semantic gap problem. Okay, The semantic gap problem is that the hypervisor only sees raw memory snapshots or it only sees low-level hardware events, right? If you're doing live monitoring, and this is in your other paper by Garfinkel and Rosenblum, they talk about how to do uh, you know, event monitoring. You only see faults, right? Sitting with the hypervisor, uh, if there's an event of interest, you'll see that there is a fault that is raised. You don't know why the fault was raised, but you'll see that, okay, there was a fault. That's all you'll see. Okay, you have to be able to make sense of why that fault was there. 
and that can only be provided by the layer above or this uh, this additional security information that you give in this particular case the information that we gave was all of these hints so where do these hints come from well the hints come from the fact that your knowledge tells you that what is running over here is a particular version of the operating system remember you know these data structures differ from operating system version to operating system version even the definition of the structures can change so you need to have some side information of exactly what is running um, on the system above you okay so that even if you were to get this low level information that the hypervisor has access to all of these memory pages this additional metadata information about the operating system about what is being monitored is given and then you can fill in the details okay so that is what this is right so that is this information that additional information that you provide so as to be able to interpret the hypervisor's output that is called a semantic gap bridging library so this these two things over here that i have i'm telling you are examples of one such semantic gap bridging library that paper by garthical and rosenblum also talks about how uh, you can do intrusion detection within the os kernel and they talk about a different um, you know uh, semantic gap bridging library but basically these are pieces of information that are given to the analysis tool that consumes the output of the hypervisor um, and allow this analysis tool the security analysis tool to make meaningful deductions or meaningful inferences about the data that's provided by the hypervisor so let's see how you know you can you can use this to traverse memory well what you will do is you know as i said you know init task is at a particular location you know this physical address you go to that physical address it's just a particular offset in this memory pages and you will read the contents over there okay how much to read well in this particular case right let's just say that this task struct has at least these three fields so this is a four byte value four byte value or the four byte value I'm putting dot 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 but let's just say that task struct only had three fields okay then it would be a 12 byte uh, uh, structure you would go and read 12 bytes um, the first four bytes will be something called state the next four bytes will be something called counter and the next four bytes will be a pointer okay now that you have a pointer you can make a work list right you got some pointers over here you're getting more pointers through this process of discovery and you can iterate this to get more structures okay so now you will go and start exploring at ac three four five six bc okay that will be another task struct and then you will get more data like this you can actually reconstruct from a snapshot the complete operating system state by the way this is pretty much what a garbage collector would do in java for example when it's trying to reclaim memory goes and reconstructs an active state of whatever is there in memory and then reconst and then reclaims everything else okay so this is how you would uh, reconstruct the entire operating system now there is an important question that i am not really talking about here it's there in the paper which is that of when to take a snapshot right remember this is a snapshot of the memory pages which means that it is the view of the virtual machine that's running on top of this hypervisor at a given instant in time so this instant in time when you pause and take the virtual machine snapshot better be an instant when the operating system is not doing something to modify the data structure okay so for example you know if you take this windows 4 rootkit maybe the operating system was in the process of uh, was you know just creating a new process and in doing so it was modifying these linked lists and if you pause the operating system when it was just modifying these linked lists and these pointers are not set up properly the data structures will not be reconstructed properly in snapshot this is a big problem okay and so if you go and see the paper that's assigned reading for you osck you will see that they talk about this notion of operating system quiescence okay they talk about the right moments the precise moments at which it is appropriate to go and take the operating systems 
uh, snapshot and these are called quiescent snapshots or quiescent moments uh, and so that's an important policy decision that any such tool would have to make to determine when to go and get these snapshots so that when you reconstruct the operating system state it's actually a meaningful reconstruction okay all right so that is how you you know go and reconstruct the operating system state and then once you have the entire operating system's data structures you know you would have a database of invariants of this sort and you can just check it that's it's as easy as that now let me tell you about one final technique right so if you have got malicious code in user space uh, how do you prevent its execution uh, especially injected code well you have got tricks like wxorx okay but how do you prevent malicious operating system code from executing right so let's say that you downloaded a malicious driver and that this malicious driver is sitting inside and it's executing how can you detect it well same thing right what you can have is that you have a guest domain which has an operating system and application these might be potentially malicious right the operating system might have malicious code in it there might be malicious applications and we can implement our checking daemon as a trusted daemon over here uh, that's running with this trusted domain. And the way that we can do this is that we can take every clean distribution of an operating system and fingerprint it. Okay. By fingerprinting it, I mean that you take your operating system and you take its binary, right? And then take the binary as though it would be laid out in memory. So how are operating system things laid out in memory? How is the operating system's code layered out in memory? Well, it's laid out in pages. So what you do is that you pretend that the operating system is laid out in pages and go take a hash of every 4K byte page. Okay, and you form a database. This is called a hash database. So if you are only going to fingerprint good operating systems or good versions of operating systems, you'll have a hash database of every piece of good code that can run and so whenever your operating system executes a code page for the very first time your hypervisor will set wxrx protection in fact it will prevent code pages from executing in the first place because the hypervisor controls the page tables so that when the guest domain tries to execute that page it traps to the hypervisor at that point in time, the hypervisor forwards this code page to the checking daemon, which will then check it against the hash database. It will hash this page, check it against the database. And if it's there in the database, right, you can resume the guest. You can actually give execute permissions to that page from the hypervisor and let that page continue. Don't give it write permission so it's not modifiable in the future, but you let it continue. But if it doesn't match, you know that it's a new code page. You have not fingerprinted it. It is possibly malicious code that you have injected, so you can stop the execution of that guest domain and alert the user that something potentially wrong is going on. So you can use this method not just to detect malicious pages within the operating system. You can actually use the same method to go and um, detect malicious applications, malicious binaries in executing. It's a very, very interesting approach. And if you're interested, and this is not one of the assigned readings for this course, but I will encourage you to go and read this paper. It's a very interesting approach to this problem of detecting malicious code. Uh, it's called Patagonics. Uh, let me just open it up for you so you know which paper it is. Uh, just a second. Hypervisor support for detecting covertly executing binaries. And this is not one of the assigned readings for your course. Nevertheless, I would strongly encourage you to go and read this paper. Uh, it was published in Usenix Security 2008. Uh, it's a very interesting approach to go and detect malicious binaries uh, with the help of the hypervisor, which goes to show another applications of uh, of uh, hypervisors to the problem of security okay so that brings me to the end of uh, this lecture on hypervisors uh, it's a very very rich topic um, ever since this seminal paper by garfickel and rosenblum 
in 2005, there has been pretty much a cottage industry of uh, papers, tools, uh, commercial products uh, that use hypervisors to improve security. And we will see applications of this, uh, of course, in the modern setting in cloud computing scenario uh, later on in this course. So with that, I will conclude the lecture on virtualization. Thank you very much.